Association meeting and our grand luncheon. We are so excited to have with us as our keynote speaker and special guest of honor, Justice Mariano Florentino Cuellar. Thank you. I have some prepared remarks, but I'd like to recognize some special guests we have with us uh, before making those remarks. Um, we have among us uh, just judges of the California Superior Court, including Judge Garcia Akarian, Judge Andre Mansurian, Judge Maria Dalian Hernandez, and they will be speaking this afternoon for our afternoon panel. But we also have our very own judge and former chair of Armenian Bar Association, Zagan Sinanian. Please welcome our judges. thank uh, some of our uh, benefactors and that made all of this possible today, and including our spon major sponsors, Mestro Futagalian and Tina Ojafian of the Ojafian Law Group. Thank you for making this possible. We also have with us the chairman of the board of Golden State Bank, Tom Byington. Mr. Byington, thank you for being here. And I, for those of you who weren't at the start of the meeting today, we were very fortunate to have with us Professor Jessica Peake of UCLA, who was uh, the, talked to us about the uh, Promise Institute at UCLA, which was an uh, institute founded by a grant by the late Kirk Kerkorian. So Professor Peake, we're so happy you're here with us again. Thank you for joining us. prepared remarks now. Uh, there is a phrase that has become a part of the vernacular of pop culture that I'm sure many of us have heard. You'll most commonly hear it said when a man introduces another man by the phrase, this is my brother from another mother. <laughs> Though often said in a lighthearted manner, the phrase, my brother from another mother, when said, connotes a bond which exists that runs deep in respect, love, and admiration. Back in the day, Armin and I remember these days, we would have referred to a brother from another mother as my soul brother, or my blood brother, or maybe we would have described the relationship as a bromance. <laughs> these are all great terms, I think, to describe the bond between the two speakers we'll be hearing from during our great grand luncheon this afternoon. When Justice Mariano Florentino Cuellar met Carney Kirkonian during their freshman year at Harvard University, they probably didn't realize how much they shared in common and what a strong and lasting friendship they would form. Maybe it was because their roots hailed from the heroic cities of Matamoros, Mexico, in the case of Justice Cuellar, where key battles in the struggle for Mexican independence took place or in Ainta, in the case of Kadmi, where the Armenians heroically stood their ground against their genocidal oppressors. Maybe it was their shared passion for social justice, or their drive to adhere to the great virtues of intellectualism, or their high ambition to serve the public good through a career founded on the premise that society can only function when it is governed by the rule of law and not men. It was probably all of these things and more that Justice Cuellar and Carney discovered by themselves, about themselves, during many a conversation in the confines of their Harvard University dormitory that formed the bonds of a brotherly relationship that still stands two decades after they met. 
It is a great honor for me to introduce our Vice Chairman, my brother Connie Kirkonian, who will introduce our keynote speaker, California Supreme Court Justice Mariano Florentino Cuellar. Thank you. Thank you, Sato. Aristotle once wrote, to discover the true character of a man, ask his college roommate. <laughs> Actually, these words were never uttered by anyone, ever. Yet, we are here today doing just that. Now, the California Supreme Court was gracious enough to provide me with a detailed biography of Justice Coyar, enumerating the many achievements and undertakings he has been part of. And they are absolutely remarkable. But as his college roommate, I can't help but feel compelled to relate to you certain information about Justice Coyar that would never have made it into any proper biography, <laughs> and perhaps never should. You see, the way I see it, Justice Cuellar has been on a lifelong search for his inner Armenian. <laughs> the importance of this quest was only subtly indoctrinated in him during our years at Harvard in a second floor dorm at Winthrop House along the Charles River. And this dorm was a dorm like no other at Harvard. It is here that we formed the Armenian, Harvard Armenian Students Association in 1991. It was the dorm, which Justice Cuellar recollects, where the Sayanova Dance Company of Boston insisted on convening almost every week for post-practice parties. It was the dorm room, even where a young Tom Samoyan, a past chair of this organization and now dean of the AUA Armenian University of America Law School, sat with a handful of other Armenians and discussed the birth of a new Armenian Republic over Lehmejun from the Sasu Bakery in Watertown. And it was in this dorm room that the music of Tino's beloved Fast Car by Tracy Chapman <laughs> was drowned out by the crooning of Harut Pambukchan <laughs> and the duduk of Jivan Gasparian. These were formative years for us all, and Tino took it all in with inquiry, with interest, with questions, and with reflection. He graduated Harvard magna cum laude, but then, with a guiding Armenian influence in his life in England, <laughs> he devolved into a series of erratic acts wholly unbecoming of a Harvard graduate. He attended Yale for law school. He obtained his PhD from Stanford. And it is these poor academic choices that thrust his career into what can only be described as a holding pattern. <laughs> he joined the U.S. Department of Treasury as a lawyer in, the inter in international enforcement. He has served as a Stanley Morrison professor of law at Stanford Law School. He has served as a professor of political science at Stanford University. He has directed Stanford's Freeman Smogley Institute for International Studies. He has served on the Obama presidential transition team. While on leave for Stan from Stanford, he served in the White House in numerous capacities as Special Assistant to the President for Justice and Regulatory Policy. He also negotiated vi uh, provisions in food safety, tobacco, sentencing reform. He convened the White, House White House's Food Safety Working Group and coordinated its response to the BP oil spill. He set up the President's Equal Pay Task Force. He worked on, bipart on the bipartisan repeal of the military's Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy. He led efforts to support community-based crime prevention and immigrant in integration. Later, he was a presidential employee to the governing council of the U.S. Sorry, presidential appointee to the governing council of the U.S. Administrative Conference, and he also co-chaired the U.S. Department of Education's National Equity and Excellence Commission. Clearly, something was missing. <laughs> sure, he was a young intellectual powerhouse, publishing and able to opine with commanding authority on issues ranging from administrative law, executive and legislative power, criminal justice, public health law, international law, immigration. But those formative college years had instilled, had instilled in him the need for something more. 
So, when California Supreme Court Justice Marvin Baxter, an honorary member of this organization, announced his retirement, and Governor Jerry Brown nominated Mar Mariano Florentino Cuellar to fill the Armenian American Justice's vacancy on the court. <laughs> 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 Professor Cuellar knew that his years of tortured wanderings, distant from his inner Armenian, were finally nearing their end. He was unanimously confirmed by the California Commission on Jewish Judicial Appointments and retained by the voters for a full term in November of 2014. It was now time for Justice Cuellar to reconnect to the tribe. <laughs> During a speaking engagement at the Multicultural Bar Association in Southern California last year, Justice Cuellar scanned the crowded room looking for what he knew an Armenian to be. Tall and slender. <laughs> and he found Sato Kirkonian. <laughs> Chairman of our Bar Association, and professed to him, I have always had a little bit of Yerevan in my heart. You know, perhaps there is some value in asking one's college roommate to define a man's character. At 18, I saw in the young Tino Cuellar, born in northern Mexico, raised by immigrant parents in the small town of Calexico, California, and educated in that public high school on Encinos Avenue, something familiar. We were not the students from the Grottons, the Phillips Exeters, the Andovers. We were not the children of Harvard legacies, political names, or endowments. We were public school kids from immigrant families, and we appreciated, in a way profoundly tactile and personal, what the story of this country meant to fathers, to mothers, to children, to neighborhoods, to schools, to dreams, and to hopes. And we knew that, going forward, we would have the privilege to shape that very story. Please join me in welcoming the profoundly intelligent, remarkably dynamic, and a most inspiringly accomplished jurist of the California Supreme Court, Justice Mariano Florentino. Uh, I'm overwhelmed. That is the most distinctive introduction I've ever had. And I would just like to say for the record, Lordy, I hope there are tapes. <laughs> and if there are, you can release them. Uh, I'm just going to pick up where Karnig left off. Uh, it's very clear that my connection to Armenian Americans is so strong that it's had everything to do with uh, what I've been able to accomplish. Uh, like many uh, people connected to Fresno, California um, and to Armenian Americans, I know Fresno to be the capital of California. Uh, just kidding, it's actually Glendale. <laughs> um, I have a lot of uh, very fond memories of my time with Kotnik. He would come in with this incredible energy, passion for justice. He would want to talk about what's going on in Nagorno-Karabakh. He would uh, be in those dance parties. I remember extraordinary acts of lawyering that occurred in those uh, crazy dance parties. I'm just going to tell you one, since I know there are no tapes here, of course, except those over there. Uh, but let me try to tell this in a way that will be possible to tell legally. Uh, so, uh, so one of these parties was playing out, uh, it was late in the evening, and there were many, many, many people in this dorm room. There was much stomping going on, and uh, a representative of law enforcement showed up sometime circa 11.30 p.m., maybe midnight, and walked in, and one of the people participating in the party, I think it must have been uh, Adam. Adam Hajan, yeah. Hajan. He gets up, and as I recall, this individual was not a law student, he was an engineering student of some kind, but he says, Officer, look, what you are seeing here is a dance rehearsal. Uh, all the different uh, spirits that are here are for me. I'm 21, uh, so you should just turn around and go. And remarkably enough, the police did. I, I've never seen that uh, ever, uh, nor have I seen it since. But I also remember 
they kind of need, uh, he, he taught me things in Korean, and I have tried to remember them over the years. So I asked him to um, share with me how I would express a greeting in Korean because being back in Fresno where my family would be uh, was at that point, I knew I'd have occasion to use this greeting. So I asked him to explain to me how I would say, hello, I'm pleased to, make, to meet you. And this is what he taught me. Tun hent es. It didn't go very well. I used it. By the way, um, Karnig is one of my connections to Armenian culture, but uh, I also have a special advisor for Armenian American affairs, and that is Lara Palangian, who's a lawyer who not long ago clerked for my wife Lucy Ko. Lara, please stand up. I'm glad you're here. Laura is not only incredibly bright and a terrific lawyer, she's also an actress and a singer, and also, by the way, my dad, stand up again, that's not <laughs> She is single and looking for a new man. <laughs> so single guys, you know what to do. Single guys, what you get around with? Right now, we're just like one single guy. Okay, but, you know, we'll, we'll work with what we have. Uh, and, uh, my wife, uh, what would we have? Because my wife said to me that if I help Lara find an Armenian American husband, I am promised uh, domestic tranquility and marital bliss. <laughs> so they said. I want to take a few minutes to share with you some thoughts about the world, about justice in California, and about some of what I've learned on the court. And I won't take too much time because I want us to have a dialogue and to have questions, answers, comments afterwards. But I want to start by giving some context uh, about what I see happening around the world because if you're in California, you were the opposite of cut off from the world. You're part of that world. People notice California. People know how influential California is. And in some sense, what defines California is that so many of us here either are directly related to, or are married to somebody, or are friends with, or work with somebody who is directly connected to some other land around the world. Survey that world, and you see a picture of continuity, but also a picture of change. We've been living through an extended period shaped by a kind of arrangement around uh, powerful countries around the world that goes under many names. Some people call it the liberal international order. Some people call it something else. But it has certain characteristics that have affected all of our lives. And it has to do with trade, it has to do with migration, it has to do with economic interdependence. This is a framework that began to take shape before World War I, but really began in earnest to develop after World War II. And it's been with us in some form since then. It picked up even more after the end of the Cold War. This arrangement has brought us incredible benefits. In many ways, it's why some of you, why I am here today, because that framework is all about understanding that sometimes people will be born in one country, they'll carry one culture, they'll come to another, and they can be fully and completely part of the country they have come to, thrive in that society, be lawyers, be judges. But it is also a period that has been fraught and complicated. It has not eliminated conflict around the world. It has coincided with an increase, a market increase in economic inequality. Yet, as we've seen, the combination of those factors has not been easy for societies to grapple with or to accept. <coughs> Look around the world. I doubt that you could find a single advanced industrialized democracy that is not experiencing a sense of great drama in figuring out how to reconcile these realities that I've been talking about with the pressures that they feel internally. That kind of challenge is very real. And it's the kind of thing that in some ways this organization is all about. It's about trying to be true to the ideals that any lawyer might feel in his or her country, but also to remember what's happening around the world. As we grapple with that challenge, I want to highlight three things that I'd like you to remember, and that you probably do remember, but I just want to acknowledge that I remember them too. First, we continue to face extraordinary challenges involving security and human rights. That's a fact. Not only in Syria, not only in southern Sudan, not only in Iraq and Afghanistan and the former Soviet Union, but in Asia, in Latin America, in other parts of the world. Think about this. 44% of the world lives in authoritarian regimes. Democracy is an idea. It's an abstraction for 44% of the world. And while there's less violence than in the past, 
Let's not kid ourselves. We have to live with nuclear weapons, with cyber weapons, and anybody who simply assumes that we, because we've been able to manage that in the last few decades, we'll be able to manage it in the future, might be uh, being a little too optimistic. Second, staggering challenges and changes have played out in areas involving human welfare. Those challenges are real. Lots and lots of people still don't have the kind of meal that we've just eaten right now. They don't even have the amount of calories that the World Bank says you need to live. We're talking six, seven hundred million people. But I don't want that to obscure something else that's truly extraordinary, and that is incredible advances in human welfare. Just think about what's changed in the last 115 years or so. Child mortality has gone from 43% of children born and living until age five in 1820 to 4%. So to unpack that for a moment, in 1820, 43% of the kids that were born would die by age five. Right now, with everything I've said about nuclear weapons and hunger and everything else, we should not forget in those moments where we wonder just when and how the world is going to get better, that that percentage is now down to 4%. Vaccinations against diphtheria, whooping cough, tetanus have gone from essentially 0% of the population in 1960 to 86% of the global population today. Global literacy has gone from 12% in 1820 to 85% in 2015. We have become a world of readers, of people who can share knowledge and ideas and stories in extraordinary ways when before we were a world of an oral tradition that is important in my culture and your culture too, but one that has been changed powerfully because now the vast majority of the world can read the opinions that my court writes. Yet third, despite all these improvements, we continue to face painful, difficult, hard cross-border challenges. Climate change, terrorism are two that come to mind. The solutions are elusive. They're not easy. They're not straightforward. Nobody's figured out a silver bullet. And here in California, all of that is very real. We end up working on all of this, in part because this is a place as diverse and as complex, as intricate as the world itself. Here we are in what is roughly the sixth largest economy in the world, connected to that larger world through everything from technology <coughs> to the little supercomputers you carry around in your pocket that you call a smartphone, to culture, to education, to wine, to immigration. What drew me to this particular role, unexpectedly, in addition to continuing the search for my inner Armenian, of course, <laughs> is something else. It was more than that. It was more than an interest in law and public service. It was the scale of California as a jurisdiction. We have a legal system in California, and our trial court bench is intimately familiar with this, that generates between six and eight million cases a year. In the California Supreme Court, we grant review only to 80 or 90 cases. So we're constantly struggling with this question. Is this the kind of case that will make a difference to a system that has eight or seven million cases a year? Is this going to help us clarify the law? Is it going to help our trial court judges do justice? These cases touch nearly every aspect of life, and in doing so, they reverberate not only here in California, but around the world. Life science, climate change, antitrust, criminal conspiracy, education, health, families. 20% of our cases roughly, or 20, 20 cases a year roughly, give or take, are mandatory appeals, the only mandatory cases that we get. And they have one thing in common. These are all cases that involve the death penalty. Exceptionally difficult cases, hard cases, Hard for me to go home and see my kids, talk to my kids about my work in that context. But I feel privileged to be working even on those cases with the colleagues that I do have. And here a problem comes up involving the interpretation of a statute. They're about constitutional theory. Here about economics, they're about separation of powers. And ultimately, all of this to me is about how any society honors its commitments over time. To me, law boils down to one thing. It is a commitment society makes. This is the promise we make. You get due process. You get equal protection. What does that actually mean? And we argue over that. We disagree over that. Often my colleagues think that my views are not the right ones. Sometimes I think theirs are not the right ones. But we work to find answers together. We work to build coalitions. And sometimes those coalitions take surprising forms. They are not always predictable to me. They're part of why it's a surprise to come to work every single day. 
All this plays out in a very, very large system that is not only interesting intellectually to worry about and think about what the case, what, what the case requires legally, but also administratively very interesting and complex. So step back for a moment and recognize that California has 58 counties. And these counties are all culturally pretty different and practically as well. So we have to worry about counties that are as massive as Los Angeles, where there are more people than in most states and in many countries around the world, where there are more judges than in almost every single state in the country. And then counties as small as Imperial County, where Calexico was where I grew up, where the population <coughs> is about 100,000. So when we try to figure out rules that will work for the system, funding streams that will work for the system, we have to think about those disparities. The challenges are pretty staggering. The budget is about $4 billion a year. Well over twice as many judicial officers serve in our courts with great honor as in the entire federal system combined. Think of the difficulties practically also around facilities. There's a new courthouse in San Diego. There were some complexities in the parking lot. It's solved now. But this might seem like the most banal of all things. But now think about 164,000 square miles. Think about what it's like to make sure those courthouses continue to be constructed in the midst of a recession. Or what it's like to tell a community as far flung as Los Angeles that suddenly a bunch of courthouses are going to close and people are going to have to take public transportation for an hour and a half or more to be able to get to court. For the judges who work in this system, the challenge is therefore not only how do I do justice in this particular case, but how do I stay involved in this management system to make sure justice is not just the paper that is printed on. And that involves all the choices that have to be made about how do you keep the trains running? How do you make sure that interpreters show up in the courtrooms? Let me pause there and focus more on the language piece. 210 languages are spoken in California. And yes, Armenian is a big part of it, as is Spanish. I marvel at how in LA County alone, 54% of the people who go home every day in LA County are going home to a family where they're speaking a language at home that is not English. Now, many of these folks do speak English to some extent, but here we get to the challenge that is at the heart of justice in California. It's all about one thing. It's about taking those commitments I talked about, the promise society makes, and trying to reconcile it as much as possible with what actually happens day in, day out. So the promise in our courts has to be not only, oh, well, you can kind of stumble through a conversation in English, you're going to be fine. Go show up to small claims court or go be a witness in a criminal case and we'll just kind of be fine. You know, in, in Spanish, and in Mexican Spanish particularly, and in Northern Mexican Spanish, Spanish that I learned in my house, there was an expression which is el ahí va, which is, oh, you know, there it goes. Like, we'll just kind of, we'll let it play out. We'll let it work, right? We'll kind of sweep it under the rug. That'd be the analogy of ahí va, right? So we try not to do ahí va justice in California. And that means that when somebody shows up to court in California and is one of the seven or eight million Californians that don't speak English very well, we got to make sure that person knows what's going on. Let me unpack that number. If you combine all the limited English speakers in the state of New York, all the limited English speakers in the great state of Texas, where I used to live for a little while, the food is pretty good, um, <laughs> and all the limited English speakers uh, or non-English speakers in the state of Florida and combine them, that's about as many as we have just in California. So when we think about what it means to provide interpreters to people in the right language, we're talking about massive justice and the stakes are basically trying to show the rest of the country that it can be done. Because if any state has an excuse, not excuse, I should say a temptation to say, you know what, we do the best we can, it's not that easy to provide interpreters, say in civil proceedings, we do it in criminal but not in civil, it would be California, and yet we are striving to not do that. So um, the Chief Justice, after I joined the court, asked me to take on, as an administrative responsibility, leadership of a language access task force. And it has been an incredible blessing to work with the great staff we have, with terrific judges around the state. And we've had three lodestones, three goals in this language access task force. Number one, take California from being a state that is pretty good in this to being the best in the country, and ideally the best jurisdiction in the world. As a practical matter, that has to mean getting interpreters into civil proceedings. Absolutely, it's true that if you go to a criminal proceeding, you need to have an interpreter. But what about family court? Do any of us want to see a family arguing over whether that family is going to stay together or trying to finalize their divorce and a nine-year-old kid interpreting for his parents? No. And we won't let that happen. 
But that means having to deal with the budget constraints California has, having to be smart about assigning interpreters different places, looking at technology so that we've got possible solutions to the problem of, let's say you need an Armenian language interpreter in San Jose, uh, and you don't have one in San Jose, but you have one in LA, and you need to get that Armenian language interpreter up to San Jose, and the person has to fly up, be there for 15 minutes, and then fly down, and then you pay for two days worth of interpretation. I don't think even the interpreter wants us to do that. We have to do better, right? So we're looking at video remote interpreting. We're doing a pilot project to see if we can preserve due process and still achieve these goals. That's the first goal. Here's the second goal. Think about everything that happens in a courthouse when you walk in and you're not going to court, but you want a form that will protect you from your potential abuser because you fear domestic violence, or you're trying to figure out how to deal with a landlord-tenant problem, and you're trying to understand what comes next. You try to go up to the uh, lawyers who are volunteering as community lawyers to help you connect the dots. So the signage, the forms, the uh, non-interpreter employees who are behind the counter, all of that stuff, we cannot sweep that under the rug and do ICELA either. And then there's a third thing. Think about everything that happens in your communities to the people that you talk to who are not going to court, but who have legal rights and need to understand what those rights are. So we're looking to put out multilingual videos that are short, pithy, like the short attention span that my kids have, that can be followed and understood by folks in a language that they can understand. And we're working to do that now uh, with some community-based organizations. So there's progress, but there's a lot more that needs to be done. And ultimately, I would say, my hope is that when I come back and talk to you at some point in the future, not 20 years from now, I can tell you that we've achieved these goals. But we need your help. Like, ultimately, the fact that you guys are often lawyers and that you have a connection to California in many cases, or in your own states, that you can care about this issue and speak up about it and write your legislator about it and ask questions of your judiciary about it means that you can make a difference as well. So back to California for a moment. Language access, one thing happening in a big court system, which is one small part of a huge budget and a huge society. I think about the size of our economy, an economy the size of Brazil. I think about how we have a population that's almost the size of Australia's and Canada's. I think about how we have 100 Court of Appeal justices, which is more than twice as many as the entire Ninth Circuit. I think about all these questions involving crime and punishment, American Indian law, labor, employment, water, democracy, that so many of you as lawyers touch in your lives. And then I think about how that last word I said was democracy. The context for what happens in California is what's happening in the country. And I'll close just with some very brief reflections about that. This is not an easy time. Uh, just as there is continuity and change on the international front, there is continuity and change at home as well. We face pressures that test our institutions. We face the specter of federal agents trying to conduct immigration enforcement by targeting people in courthouses in California, thereby risking the trust that people have built over time, including a lot of people who don't speak English very well, showing up to court because of elder abuse or domestic violence. I think that's wrong. We have long-standing allies outside of America that don't know quite what to make of uh, where our country's going or what it's saying. But to me, this remains the remarkable country that I chose and that chose me. And I have to tell you, aside from marrying my wife and uh, having my kids and maybe being Carnegie's roommate, uh, <laughs> naturalizing as an American uh, the year after I graduated from college, when I was in my first year of law school, is the greatest privilege I've ever had. I look around this country and I see the values that made me want to be an American pretty strong. Uh, I'm quite confident about our future because of that. I think our wisdom runs deep. I don't think anybody has a monopoly on wisdom. There are many reasons to disagree about the direction this country is taking, about the policy issues that are facing Congress, but I kind of feel like a lot of the wisdom that makes us uh, connected to this country cuts across that. We have a tradition of federalism that matters profoundly. We have an ability to integrate immigrants. We have a commitment, however imperfect, to public education of the kinds of schools that Kadni and I went to. We have wisdom that makes us know better when someone says that a judge is biased because his parents or grandparents come from another country. And above all, we have an abiding aspiration, an aspiration that our country can get closer every single year 
to the kind of ideal that John F. Kennedy talked about when he was inaugurated as president. His words are powerful, and they kind of stick with me. I find myself sometimes showing up to work, and I hear his voice, that Massachusetts twang, in my ears. And I hear him saying that he wants to live in a world where the strong are just, the weak secure, and the peace preserved. That proves elusive at best for a lot of people around the world, including people that are literally connected to us by family. It proves elusive even here, uh, where our work, achieving these ideals, is never done. Uh, that was on my mind in college, when I met Karnik uh, and marveled at how this country had a place for his family and for my family. It was on my mind when I naturalized, and it remains on my mind today. Thank you very much for being here. The justice has, uh, has, is welcoming questions. He wants to have a question and answer session, so I'm going to hand the mic back over to him. He's going to delay his flight to answer some questions for us, so let's take 15 or 20 minutes. And, uh, and thank you again, Justice. Thank you. I will preface it by just saying that I've exhausted all the Armenian that I know, so <laughs> the questions will have to be in English or Spanish. <laughs> and you can make a comment if you want, or you can ask a question. Justice, yes? Uh, uh, could you Recently, you made a decision concerning um, uh, exclusion of uh, from juries based on race. Did, are you? Can you talk about that case? Are you allowed to talk? So I can talk a little bit about it, and I'll just use my words a little with care because uh, you know petitions for a hearing are pending sometimes, and uh, these are issues that will continue to come before us. But let me let me just say this: the decision is in a case called Gutierrez, and. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about some of what I learned in the process of working on this case, which involves a Batson-Wheeler challenge to a jury selection procedure, where, as is the case in a number of situations in California and elsewhere in the country, a question comes up whether a juror or several jurors have been excluded on the basis of race, ethnicity, or similar characteristics. And two things really kind of uh, loom large in my mind as I think about what it was like to work on the case. One thing that looms very large in my mind has to do with trial court judges. I uh, joke with people that, well, let me first start with not a joke. It, it is never far from my mind that unlike a number of other members of our <coughs> highest court in California, I did not come to the bench with experience as a trial court judge. Now, that's significant because so much of what we have to deal with involves <coughs> What happened in a courtroom? Did it go right? Did it not go right? Was there a constitutional violation? What did the judge mean when he or she said X, Y, or Z? And I have to say, I'm in awe of trial court judges I, I, for many reasons. One reason is because I've seen them in action. I've benefited from what they do. But also, I happen to be married to a trial court judge. That helps. So I tell people sometimes trial court deference is kind of a way of life in my family. <laughs> <laughs> My wife's name is Lucy, by the way. I think there's another Lucy here. And there are powerful women named Lucy that I just think it's a good thing to pay a lot of attention to people named Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> That's not in the opinion, by the way. So, um, so when you're dealing with a situation where something has happened, and it happened years ago, and a trial court judge is trying to do his or her thing, and trying to do it right, and I know trial court judges here are trying to do the right thing, you have to take that very seriously. You're looking at the record and you're trying to understand what happened, you're trying to apply the law. That looms large and so that to me is an important <coughs> caution whenever the court sort of starts going in a direction where it looks like, well, here we are uh, looking at this after the fact with the luxury of time and the chance to talk to each other and great staff attorneys and law clerks and we see a problem. By the same token, I think a little bit about how I would approach a case involving a government agency, much like the government agency where I worked after law school, the Treasury Department. So if a case came up involving something involving a state or a federal agency, I find that my own time at an agency makes me both more sympathetic and also more skeptical of the agency at the same time, in the sense that I remember how hard it was to finalize a regulatory rule, to deal with the comments that came in with the notice and comment process, to work the interagency process, to just like get anything done. But I also understand what the pressures and the constraints are, and in a way it makes me grateful that somebody's in a position to review, right? Uh, 
right? So the balance that I think any reviewing court needs to strike when it comes to an issue as complex as the one that Gutierrez's opinion deals with is, can you be candid about the pressures that these judges are under and recognize that they're trying to do the right thing, but also try to help be clear about what the limits are so that it's a little bit easier for people to understand uh, how to approach that. And I, I think that's true in any case involving an important trial court decision that is sort of happening in real time without the benefit of a lot of time and space. The second thing that I'll just say, again, <coughs> fairly generally, is that this is an example of where we are in, uh, of a broader class of cases where we're sort of in dialogue with both state and federal courts. We often are in a position where we have to apply not only state law, but federal law, because federal law is implicated by what happens in our courts. Uh, but, you know, when it comes to constitutional rights, it's important for all Americans to remember that they always have at least two constitutions that are relevant to them, the federal one and whatever rights they have under a state constitution. And that may not come into play the same way in every case, but it does uh, serve as a reminder that we're kind of in dialogue. And even the name of the doctrine at issue here, Batson Wheeler, underscores that you have this doctrine rooted in both the state constitution and the federal one, too. Yes, over there. Ms. Blair, uh, quick question by uh, your predecessor, Justice Baxter. Uh, he used to institute a little uh, externship program, and I was part of that program. He, he, I was an individual, probably wasn't or shouldn't, probably not gotten the position, just to be straight out of. My trajectory was going, but I probably didn't qualify under some of the standards. I wasn't the top 2% of my class, whatnot. But he gave me a shot that let me get into DC to work for a Federal Trade Commission and move on and you know, do the trial work that I do. I was wondering, do you have an externship program that you do? And if so, what are some of the parameters there so we can kind of get some of the folks that we see that are having the trajectory who may not be in their top 2% of their class, but you can see once they get out of school, they're gonna take off. I love extern, uh, I really love having an extern program, and it does make a big difference to the court, and it gives me a chance to get to work with some amazing students who come from different backgrounds. I'll say a little bit more that, about that in a moment, but I first wanted to just acknowledge Justice Marvin Baxter, who is an honorary member of this organization. He was like the most classy and helpful friend as I was making the transition to the court. It is, um, it's a, it's a humbling thing and a really exciting thing to have had this opportunity, but it can be an intimidating thing too. And Justice Baxter was always incredibly filled with generosity of his time and just, just kind. He just pulled me in as a friend, shared all kinds of ideas and perspectives about the court, how it worked, his own journey in the court. We found we had a number of connections with each other. The Fresno connection looms very large. There's the Armenian connection, of course, and then there was the fact that Justice Baxter worked in the executive branch, in his case in the governor's office, in my case at the White House and at the Treasury, but having worked in the executive branch, we both felt like that was an important perspective to be represented on the court. We did not share his incredible love of convertible cars. <laughs> I do remember asking him, he had a very nice convertible car that he gave us a ride in when we went to see him in Sanger, California. And I asked him, I said, I, I assume that this comes with a position, right? It's not something that, you know, like it'll be passed along to the next justice, right? And he's like, no, nope, sorry, like we are good friends. I really like you, but I'm not giving you my car. <laughs> but he, we did talk about externs. And uh, to me, the externship program allows me to do some things that I cannot do quite with the clerkship program. With the clerkship, I am definitely looking for people, people who are uh, public spirited, who care about public service, who are very smart, good writers. It's harder for me to take chances with, with the Clark uh, program because we work so closely together, we depend on each other. But I can, I can still look for some of the very best people I can find, but take more chances with the externship program, and I'm grateful for that. My assistant, Alyssa, in, in my office can happily take any applications from anybody interested. I'll tell you some of the things that are important to me. Number one, that people can make a commitment while they're in school to do a semester length or summer length uh, experience because you do learn stuff. After a month, after a month and a half, things begin to click in your mind and that helps a lot. Number two, I want some indication of grit and determination that can often be reflected in academic accomplishment but can be reflected in public service or in other aspects of your life story. Number three, I'm looking for discretion and trust. Can I trust you? 
can I uh, have real confidence that you're going to keep the confidential in court? There's a question I ask to every law clerk applicant and every extern applicant, and it's a, it's a question that very few of them expect, but it's one that I find very revealing. And it's, you know, if you're like me, I would say to them, you've gone through life and you've made a bunch of mistakes in life. Uh, there are some people maybe who go through life and never make mistakes, but I'm not one of them. And in my mind, I'm also thinking, and if you think you are, you're probably not right for this um, externship. But I'll ask him, you know, if you've made mistakes in life, talk to me about a mistake you've made. Tell me what it was, how you dealt with it, and what you learned. And it's quite revealing, right? Because this is where you really get to the life story part of the grit. Uh, you might have an incredible academic record, but draw a blank and say, I can't think of a single mistake I've made. Or, you know, I made some mistakes, but I'm not really sure like what I learned about it. And there's a kind of human element that comes in that is really important to me. Thank you. Uh, yeah, right over there. So um, one of the biggest causes of concern right now uh, are the ICE agents that have been showing up at courthouses across the country. And uh, it has a very big chilling effect, as many of you already know, on witnesses and victims of crime. And I know that the California Supreme Court has been taking a, a righteous stance against uh, Jeff Sessions in the Attorney General's office. Uh, to the extent that it's possible, if such uh, allegations or such uh, incidents occur again, what are the follow-up steps that the California Supreme Court can do uh, in order to make sure that we are uh, ensuring of people's rights, ensuring of victims of crime, and uh, being a place of uh, sanctity for all. So we talked about federalism earlier, and it gives me a chance to underscore that federalism is very important in our country. I used to work with federal law enforcement, the Treasury Department, in the Enforcement Division, and I have great respect for people who enforce federal law. They have a hard job. I used to work with some of the very people who uh, were doing policy-related issues connected to customs enforcement, which back then was at Treasury, and now that, those functions are all part of ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, which is the agency that also enforces immigration laws domestically. Laws have to be enforced, and I get that. But I think it's really important to recognize what the equities are at the end of the day. And the, the issue that has really galvanized interest among some judges in California, including our Chief Justice, who has spoken very clearly about this issue, and uh, I try to speak clearly about it as well, is what it means to exercise judgment and smarts when you're thinking about the full range of values that are involved in what it takes to make our legal system run. And I start with a simple premise, which is a court should be a safe place. That's why we have bailiffs, that's why we have the CHP, that's why we have the sheriff's office. That's why we try to create in the court a space where anybody can come and say, I have a legal problem and I need redress. I need that form signed so that I can get some help or protection because of a domestic violence issue, for example. So judgment and some exercise of good judgment in particular is really important in how we achieve these multiple goals. And at the end of the day, nobody, I think, in the California judiciary can honestly think that immigration enforcement is our policy issue. But they can and should think that what happens in our legal system and in our courts is really important. The very same thing that makes me so passionate about language access, about making sure somebody shows up to a court and doesn't turn away and just leave after five minutes, eight minutes confused because they can't speak the language even though they need some help, that that doesn't happen to somebody else who needs to come to court because she fears that she or some family member is going to be caught up in immigration enforcement. It's going to happen inside the courthouse. So um, the federalism point is important in another way as well, which is our system in California of courts is strong because it is a unified system, but it is also a decentralized system to some extent. It is one where the 58 counties have significant responsibility to make sure justice is done in their courthouses and their courtrooms, and we all work together. But as a result of that, I think it's particularly important that the courts at the county level, the trial courts, have a norm where incidents are reported to the office of the presiding judge, and the presiding judge takes that seriously and know that as far as our chief justice is concerned, she's spoken, many of others, others have spoken, and at the trial court, there should be some deliberation and some effort made to deal with these issues as best they can be dealt with. 
So this is an ongoing thing, right? It's at the end of the day something that is not going to be solved today, it's not going to be solved tomorrow. But I kind of view like the most important things in this country, the things that really involve how we, we make our, our laws and our justice real, they're never solved in one day. Another issue I keep seeing up in the courts is the budget cuts. And the cuts have been instituted under Brown since 2010. The, uh, and I know Chief Justice has been pushing hard for those, but we're seeing the problems all over the place associated with getting uh, folks in larger counties to the courthouses, as I indicated, like in LA County, Lancaster, or whatnot. We're losing those, and those folks now have to figure out how they're going to come down 40 miles, 30 miles to the courthouse. Or likewise, uh, my, it's a, almost my clients that do a lot of work to say on a contingency on the planning side, and they're not getting their juries, and they're going to have to get their matters pushed off two, three, four times in, up in San Mateo County where I reside. And the problem becomes, all right, now you start to uh, infect the economics associated with it. We've talked to these members of the assembly like Jerry Hill and whatnot. Uh, at this point, what is it that the courts are seeking in terms of budget? What's the shortfall that we're looking at going forward, and how can we aid in trying to get that gap closed because it's not only impacting uh, our clients, but it's, just, it's starting to, you can see it disenfranchise a lot of people. Is that there's almost a distrust being developed as the courts say we're never going to get justice. Insurance carriers are dragging this stuff along and we're never going to, you know, get recovery. And they're never made whole because of that delay. Uh, so I guess the question first is what's the shortfall and what would be the recommendation you make as uh, our organization? What can we do try to shore that up to get, you know, Brown, whoever, maybe Newsom, whoever's going to be the next governor, to start treating this as a co-equal branch of government. Thank you so much for your question. Our courts have done extraordinary things during this period of budget austerity, and I say that because notwithstanding the real impacts on a lot of litigants that have been severe and unfortunate, and the difficulty for many people of going to a courthouse that is further away, I'm also impressed with how our judges and our staff are managing to provide as much access to justice as they can, keeping small claims court going in many, many courts, trying to expand access to justice through different approaches, potentially to settlement of cases, and that's happening right here, and, and I know some judges are doing a great job on that. But the reality remains, and it's what you say, we've lost about a billion dollars of funding over the last few years since the recession hit. And over time, we've climbed back out of the hole a little bit where the level of yearly funding has gotten closer to what the level was. But the fact remains that in that time during the recession that the courts were being underfunded, we had to basically take a loss of almost a billion dollars. And ultimately, I think it would be a terrific thing to see some restoration of that money. Now, let's be practical and realistic. Everybody has had to face some pain in the state as we've adjusted to austerity and as we prioritize as a, as a people, as a, as a state, getting to a point that is more fiscally responsible. But we've got to realize that it's penny wise and pound foolish to underfund the courts because so much of what people are trying to get that affects their ability to just participate fully in the economy, whether it's to stay in their home or to make sure a small business dispute gets resolved runs through our courts in some way. So I have reason to hope, but also reason for concern. On the hope side, I would focus on how well courts have managed to do the best that they can with the resources they have, despite real cuts in services. You know, and what we're doing in language access is an example of that. A small silver lining in what's happened in LA County, which is not in any way a justification for it, it's just an indication of how we're trying to be creative when we can is that because there are fewer courthouses that are open, the interpreters are consolidated in fewer locations. So when you're paying interpreters on the half day, you can assign them more effectively and smartly to be able to do perhaps more than one proceeding because they're more likely to be co-located. So making use of the opportunities that open up is important, but also important is not losing sight of what you've talked about, which is making sure that we reach out to whoever needs to hear this message. And I, for one, think, it's a good thing for the governor and his staff to know that people care a great deal about the courts and how they work. And perhaps also that people understand that the courts have also sustained some major, major cuts. At one point we had a third of the staff that we had before the downturn. That's staggering when you think about it. All the extra work that has to happen that has to be done by a smaller number of people. 
So I'm hopeful that people will get that message eventually and that that over time will put the courts on the right path. But I think it's important for all of us to realize that we're not there yet and all Californians directly or indirectly end up being affected. Thank you. Um, yeah, questions? Okay, over here. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I practice immigration law in Los Angeles for a lot of years now and come from an immigrant family and I think I can speak for many of us here that we empathize and I'm so impressed having been born in this country at the achievements that, I mean, I have goosebumps now thinking of my family, people like you who have accomplished so much on an ideal that, you know, we're used to and maybe take for granted just a little bit. Having said this, Dealing with your work with interpreters. Uh, in the immigration practice, I see it in two different ways. One in particular with Armenia. Huge problem getting qualified translators who speak Armenian and English in Armenia. The amount of time, you talk about time wasted, many, many months can be wasted on a case because you can't locate a proper interpreter. It, it, it seems crazy and maybe impossible, but it's true. If you're talking about technical uh, uh, language that needs to be uh, interpreted, such as in the field of psychology or mathematics or engineering, so you need somebody who knows maybe a little bit of both, that's one. The other is that in the immigration courts, now I mean I don't even speak Spanish fluently anymore. I'm there, I'm listening to the interpreter. They're interpreting, I say, have to say to the judge once in a while this has happened, Your Honor, the interpreter is not interpreting correctly. And so, you know, the standards that exist for uh, certification, licensure, whatever uh, exists for, it, at least in the immigration courts, is really not all that stringent. And if there's anything that you could do to uh, better assure uh, more qualified interpreters, more education, whatever they have to do to make sure that the interpretation is done correctly and accurately. The amount of time it would save the court and the justice that people get to certainly would be affected. Thank you very much. I very much agree with you. I'll say a little bit more about it. The problem you raise is a very real one and it has a couple of different components. One is, it's one thing to simply say, oh, we provide some language assistance. It's another thing to make sure the language assistance is at the appropriate level of quality. And if it's not, then it can at best be not good enough, and at worst, it can be worse than not having it. And I mean, we're talking about legal consequences that affect the rest of people's lives in some cases. So um, we deal with that in several ways. One way we deal with it is by making sure that wherever possible, people have uh, interpreters that are certified, by trying to be a leader in certification of interpreters, and by trying to speed up that certification process, by trying to attract more people into the interpreting profession. Obviously, that raises questions also of the you know, what it means to be a professional interpreter in our courts, and you know, I would like to think that we can be better and better over time in making it a great profession for people. But another aspect of what you're talking about is uh, what happens when things don't go well. So we need a complaint system for the interpreters that are provided so that folks can say, like, something fell through the cracks here, it didn't work, there's a problem, an evaluation system for folks going forward. Now, any time a big organization or a big jurisdiction has been doing things in one way, it's hard to change. That's partly why I mentioned just the scale of our justice system. And I get that starting something new can be disconcerting for people, for interpreters who have been working hard and they're asking, well, now I'll be subjected to a, a complaint process potentially or you know, some review process, but I also think that if we listen to people, we can do it right and we can get it done, and that's important. And then last but not least, Important though it is to try to get as much uh, as we can close to the ideal of interpreters being certified and having all the right qualifications, sometimes it cannot be done. Like we might be talking about uh, Mayan dialect where we just don't have a certification process because we're talking about a very small number of speakers, but big enough to be important in our court system. And there I would say we have to be smart and pragmatic and let the, not let the perfect be the enemy of the good and not box ourselves up into a situation where simply because we can't have the perfect, we end up still stuck with family members who don't, aren't able to do the interpretation very well doing the interpretation. So 
All that is on my mind. I would say it's an ongoing process. I think we are in a better place now than we were two and a half years ago, but we have a lot more work to do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Justice Clayon, we have a special uh, presentation for you, a, a gift. We're so honored that you are here with us today. This is a painting by a very talented artist in Glendale, Sirun uh, She. This is inspired by illuminated manuscripts that uh, have been part of Armenian art history for centuries, millennia, and um, she she's followed in that tradition, and uh, Sirun is beautiful woman, she's suffering from ALS now, but uh, this is one of her artwork, and Karnik wrote the inscription, and he'd like to read it to you right now. Please. Yeah. All right. The Armenian Bar Association, on the occasion of its 28th annual meeting, proudly acknowledges the Honorable Mariano Florentino Cuella, California Supreme Court Justice. Hold fast, my countrymen. Though the thrashing waves of the iniquitous will pound mercilessly against stone and shore to unsound its call, I assure you that in, our, that in time, in our time, tyrants indeed will kneel before it, the meek indeed will rise amidst it, and the, and the words of our wise indeed will bloom thickly beneath, beneath its enduring glow. Behold justice, my countrymen, and embrace it with unfettered resolve, for in your unshaking grip it shall neither shudder nor dare blink before even the most unyielding of swords. Wow, thank you.